Mr. Hepperswit, uh, did PO have a duty to consult the unions in good time over the redundancies pursuant to section 188 of the uh, Trade Union Act of 1992? So there's absolutely no doubt that we were required to consult with the unions. We chose not to do that because we believe. You chose to break the law? Because we chose not to consult and we will come and we are and will compensate everybody in full for that i recognize that this is a really when difficult... you get in your car and drive on the motorway and you see the 70 mile an hour sign do you decide that that's not going to apply to me i'm going to do 90 uh, because i think it's important that i do that is that how you go about your life no no it isn't did the collective in agreements in place between pno and rmt and nautilus provide for negotiation over such matters as redundancies Sorry, could you rephrase the question? D you had collective agreements Correct. with RMT and, P uh, 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 and Nautilus. That provides for negotiation over such matters of redundancies. You've done it before. Why didn't you do it? What was the moral justification for you not doing that? Okay, so this is, these are very extreme circumstances. Let me, can I, in order to answer that question fully, can I explain the difference between the operational uh, model that we previously had and the one that we are moving to, so that you understand how fundamental a change it is, and that helps me explain why we had to take the route we had to take. Would you allow me I'm to sorry, do that? Sorry, as the Chair has already pointed out, there's many companies that have difficulties. They obey the law and they consult with their, with their members through, through their trade unions. You haven't done that. But we've moved from one operating model to another. And you, haven't, you haven't escaped the law of this country. You've still got to do it within the legal framework. You can't just decide that you're going to absent yourself from the legal system of the United Kingdom. So it, is, it, is, it was our assessment that the change was of such a magnitude that no union could possibly accept our proposal. Oh, you're and right that about that, Mr. I've never heard such farcical answers to a series of questions. OK, look, can I move on, Chair? Um, in selecting UK employees, most of whom will be UK nationals or residents, uh, or residents uh, when you select them for dismissal, P&O has evidently discriminated against them on grounds of nationality. What was the legal justification for doing this? So to be clear, actually, these weren't exclusively UK nationals. Uh, they were largely UK nationals, but this, is an, this was an, a group of international um, employees. So what are the new rates of pay to be offered to the new crews? How much are you paying them? So the, two models, the two models are very different. So to answer that question is a bit more complicated, if you can allow me the time. The previous operating model required us to have four crews for every ship on Dover Calais. The new operating model um, uh, re requires us to have two, ship, two crews and pay people when they work. So they're, they're assessed in slightly different ways. The answer to your question is that the average Jersey seafarer was, in, was paid £36,000 and will receive £46,500. So a year and a third in compensation. So that's part of the answer to the question. The second part of the question is, what are the hourly rates of pay uh, for the new model? So the average hourly rate of pay is £5.50. On top of that, there is a pension contribution. There is food yeah, and accommodation. Pension contribution. That's more than minimum wage. And then, sorry, can I make a couple of points, please? So on the routes, that are international routes that are governed by ITF standards, we are paying above ITF minimum wages. And on our domestic route, which I think was referenced earlier, Lyon Cairn Ryan, where we are governed by national minimum wage, of course we are paying national minimum wage. And, and so, uh, so the seafarers aboard the vessels that are leaving Dover, the replacement crew, they're going to be paying on, a, on average, paid at the rate of £5.50 per hour. Yes. That's below the national minimum wage of this country. How do, you, how do you reconcile that? Where we are governed by national minimum wage, we will absolutely pay national minimum wage. Oh. This is an international seafaring model that is consistent with uh, models throughout the globe and our competitors. Could you live on it, Mr Hepworth, at £5.50 an hour? Could you, could you sustain your lifestyle at £5.50 an hour? No, you couldn't, could you? Why do you expect people who've got such responsible jobs to be able to do that? How do you expect them to be able to feed their families and pay their bills at £5.50 an hour? 
So there's a couple of very, very important points here. One, yes, it, one one's is called that gas, one's called electric. Those are the important points. They can't pay their bills. One, a couple of important points, please. Um, these, uh, the seafarers who join us are international <coughs> professional seafarers with all the international certification. These are, these are experienced seafarers. I'm going to move on. 